Oh, hello, Barry. Okay, he can he can hear us and see us. Anyway, I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, it's a very special night tonight. <clears throat> it's not very often. In fact, I don't know if it's ever happened where Lake Village has had a world authority on anything come speak to them. And we're honored tonight to have Barry Schwartz all the way from Colorado via the miracle <clears throat> of Zoom uh, to talk to us about the Shroud of Turin. Um, have any of you in here not heard of the Shroud of Turin? Everybody heard of it? You've not heard of it? Who's not heard of it? Okay. Well, Barry is going to teach us a lot about it. It's essentially, in my opinion, the the greatest Christian relic there is. And uh, you'll be you'll learn a whole lot more in the next hour. But let me give um, Barry the introduction that's due him. Um, we met uh, a number of weeks ago when I was preparing for the talk that I gave here on the Shroud. I wanted some information, and uh, there's a website called Shroud.com, which uh, Mr. Schwartz founded way back before the internet was much of an internet. And uh, I went there and wanted to use some pictures and contacted him, and he helped talk me through downloading them. And I did use a number of photos from him. He is the official documenting photographer for the Shroud of Turin Research Project. This group of scientists studied the Shroud of Turin extensively in 1978. It was the last and the only scientific uh, exploration of the Shroud that was ever done. Um, Mr. Schwartz spent five days and nights with the Shroud, during which time studies were performed literally around the clock, 24 hours a day. This team had five days and nights to study the Shroud in Turin, Italy, uh, which is where it's kept and has been for a number of hundred years. <clears throat> so tonight, he's going to share some of those findings with us. Uh, he started the internationally recognized Shroud of Turin website, shroud.com, which has had over 15 million visitors. In 2009, he founded the Shroud of Turin Education and Research Association called STERA, which is a nonprofit 501c3 <clears throat> corporation to which he donated the website in his extensive Shroud photographic collection. He uh, currently serves as president of STERA. <clears throat> this site, being nonprofit, exists by accepting donations. And tonight, after he talks, we're going to take up a collection which will go to STERA to help finance research and education on the Shroud. Um, he, Barry, has not charged us any speaker fee to be here tonight, so I just ask and encourage you to be generous. He's a very busy man, as you might imagine. He's conducted shroud lectures around the world and is frequently called upon as a leading imaging expert. He has participated in programs on the History Channel, the Discovery Channel, the Learning Channel, CNN, CBS, NBC, PBS, the BBC, and Vatican Radio. His photographs have appeared in hundreds of books and publications, including Time, Life, Newsweek, and National Geographic, and in countless television documentaries. He co-authored a book titled The Turin Shroud, The Illustrated Evidence, which I have a copy of, of course. And um, so we're pleased um, to have you, and let's all join in and give him a welcome to Lake Village. Okay. Okay, hopefully everybody can hear me. Give me a thumbs up, Doc. <laughs> okay, good. Because <laughs> there's no way I can tell <laughs> whether you can hear me or see me. So at any rate, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm honored to have this opportunity. Um, as, as I always tell everybody, I love doing Zoom meetings because I only have to look good from the waist up. <laughs> uh, at any rate. Um, I'm going to start before I start the presentation. I want to answer the question that I get asked most often. And rather than waiting to the end where there will be a, some time for uh, questions, I thought I'd better answer this question in advance uh, just to let people uh, know and give them a sense of it. Because the question I get asked all the time is, how did you get involved with the Shroud of Turin? So I'm going to give you a quick story here. 
Back in the 1970s, I operated a commercial photographic studio in Santa Barbara, California. Uh, one of the clients I had was a local company that was a contractor to Los Alamos National Laboratories. We know who they are. And um, I worked on a project for Los Alamos with this company for seven months, and it had to do with atomic bombs. So uh, I can't tell you much more about it because it's pretty classified stuff. But we did that for seven months, and I worked with a gentleman named Don Devan. Well, just a few weeks after we finished that project, I got another phone call from Don Devan. And if you're self-employed, you know that when the phone rings, you're always praying that that's your next project to work on. So when Don called me again, I thought, aha, uh -huh, perhaps something else for Los Alamos. And Don said, well, not exactly. He said, what do you know about the Shroud of Turin? Well, at that point, I kind of laughed and I said, but Don, I'm Jewish. And Don laughed and said, so am I, remember? So ironically, I was invited onto the Shroud of Turin Research Project by one of the other Jewish team members that were on the team. There were three of us on the team. And so that's how I got involved with the Shroud. When he asked me what I knew about it, I said, I don't know much about it. I uh, but I thought it was a fake. I mean, I didn't have any knowledge of it. And of course, at that moment in history, there really wasn't much published about the Shroud outside of some religious tracts that came from the Holy Shroud Guild in uh, Esopus, New York. And that was four Catholic priests who uh, were in the United States, uh, one, one from Turin, uh, uh, Father Peter Rinaldi was from Turin himself, and they were promoting the Shroud here in the United States. They were instrumental in getting our team the permission to actually physically examine the Shroud. In 1978, the church didn't own the Shroud. Of course, it doesn't own it now either, but it's owned today by the living Pope. But in 1978, the Shroud was owned by King Umberto II, a Duke of Savoy, the monarchy of Italy, and it had been in their family for over 500 years. So uh, when Father Peter Rinaldi, who happened to be friends with the king, uh, made the connection and gave the king our 60 or 70 page test plan, the king evaluated it and approved it and gave us permission that it had never been given before or since. Uh, and so that gave us the permission to do our five day and night examination of the shroud. And with that in mind, what I'll do next is I'll start the presentation. I'm going to show you, uh, I'll give you an introduction to the shroud, show you the features of the shroud that make it so unique. And then I'll take you behind the scenes and show you exactly what our team encountered in that five days and nights when we had to examine the shroud. And at the end, I'll show you the conclusions that our team drew based on the scientific data that we collected. So with that in mind, let me see if I can make this work. Okay, let's see if that everything works. Just bear with me for a sec. <laughs> this is always the fun part. Hey, it, look at that, it worked. All right. Let me just do that. Okay. Oh, let me back up. I'm sorry. Here we go. All right. Now if everything's working properly. So this is the title. It's because we've got 45 years now since we examined the shroud. It's still hard for me to believe I was one of the young lads on the team. I was 32 years old. I'm now 77. So it's been a while. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the shroud itself. At any rate, the Shroud of Turin is a 14 and a half foot long, three and a half foot wide sheet of pure linen cloth made from the flax plant, uh, as is prescribed, by the way, in the Old Testament that someone of high stature be buried in pure linen raiments. And this is pure linen, no cotton or wool intermixed with it, which is forbidden by Jewish law. It's called the mixing of the kinds. What makes the shroud unique isn't its size as much as what it 
bears as an image on it. Now, when you look at the shroud, you can immediately see all these triangular shaped patches and these scorches and burns that run along either side. But what's important is what's between those burns and scorches. And that's the image ventral front or dorsal back head to head of a crucified man. Now, how do you get a head to head image on a sheet of cloth? This is the way the cloth would have wrapped the body if uh, to, to create an image like we see on the shroud with the head, uh, ventral and dorsal head almost touching each other. Now, nobody knew much about the shroud until 1898 when this gentleman, a lawyer, Secundo Pia, took that camera, which by, is by no means anything like what we're used to today, and he had to use large glass plates, and he made the very first photographs of the Shroud of Turin. Until then, only people in Northern Italy might have known about it, perhaps in uh, Eastern France, which isn't that far from Turin. But outside of that area, not many people had ever heard of the Shroud of Turin. Once the Quindopia made his photographs of it, however, that's when the photographs could be published. They were published in books and magazines and journals. And all of a sudden, the rest of the world became aware that there was this unique piece of cloth that bears this very unique image, excuse me, in Turin, Italy. <clears throat> now, when Secundo Pia looked through his camera, of course, this is what he saw, a natural color of the shroud itself. But in 1898, there was no color film. So he had to photograph it on black and white film. And this is the result of what he saw on his photographic negative. Now, because of that, and because it's a little difficult to see even in this uh, orientation, let's make it easier. Now, let me move, see if I can move this window out of here. Hang on a sec. All right, well, I've got something blocking part of my screen here, but we'll live with it. Now you can clearly see the man standing before you. You can see the blood stains in the head from a cap or crown of thorns, not just a pretty little circlet the way uh, Christian artists have depicted the crown of thorns over the years. Let's face it, they didn't ask one of the Roman soldiers to weave a pretty crown to put on this supposed criminal that they were about to execute. They took a thorn bush and they smashed it onto his head because he had proclaimed himself king of the Jews. Oh, really? You're the king of the Jews. So here's your crown. And we have bloodstains covering the scalp, not just in a circlet, the way it's been depicted by Christian artists over the years. Uh, underneath the chin is a crease. That crease is came from rolling the shroud up on a dowel and putting it in a reliquary box for five centuries. And so it's pretty much pressed in. There was actually a crease above the forehead, but we were able to smooth that one out before I made my photograph. So you can see blood stains on the head. You can see the face. You can see the cheekbones are both swollen, one more so than the other. You can see blood dripping down the forehead. You can see as we go further down, you can see the spear wound and the blood flow from that spear wound. You can see it better here in the color image. These triangular shaped items are patches that were sewn in by the poor Clare sisters in 1534. The shroud was in a fire in 1532 in Chambry, France, and the sisters, poor Clare sisters, repaired it, sewed in these patches. I have to tell you that in 2002, those patches were all removed. The backing sheet that the sisters sewed onto it to give it added stability was removed and replaced with a newer, wider backing sheet which sadly made it a little harder to see the image. But that's part of the history of the shroud. As we continue on down, we see blood stains on the arms, and you can see an exit wound from a crucifixion nail at the back of the, the hand. Now, I always point out the fact that this is not in the center of the palm, but just about an inch or so towards the wrist, and that would give us an exit wound exactly and precisely where we see it on the shroud. I also, also have to remind you that the forensic pathologists and medical doctors who have studied the shroud have testified that these blood stains are, are, are authentic blood stains. They were not painted on after the fact. 
in fact, where there's blood on the shroud, there's no image, which tells us the blood went onto the cloth first, and then the image formed, but the blood stains inhibited the image formation mechanism, whatever it was. And so we do have uh, blood stains that are forensically accurate, and that's very important. Uh, continuing further down, we see this is a water stain down here. You can see it more clearly on the black and white negative view. And the one on the right here, the contrast has been enhanced to make it more visible for you. And so you can see the image more clearly than you can in the natural color view. The image is only about 20% darker in the darkest point than the background. So it's a very subtle image to begin with. Continuing on, we go to the bottom here, we see blood stains at the feet, also from crucifixion nails. We cannot tell from the shroud whether they used one nail for each foot or one foot was on top of the other and a single nail was used. But historically, they have found remains of two crucifixion victims and both of them had a single nail through each side of the ankle, implying that four nails were used rather than three. I know that the folks of the Catholic faith liked the uh, idea of three nails because it ties to the Trinity. We cannot tell to a scientific certainty whether three nails or four nails were used. But I think from a practical standpoint, the Romans probably used four because it's a lot easier than trying to put one foot over another and drive a nail through both. That wouldn't be very simple. And I don't know, if, but the man on the shroud, but if it were me, I'd be using the other foot to kick the guy trying to nail my feet to the cross. So I, I think that each foot was nailed individually, but that's just my personal opinion. The evidence on the shroud doesn't tell us to a, a scientific certainty whether it was one or two nails for the feet. Now, before I go, before I leave this, this ventral front view, I'm going to point something, something out to you. We know that Jesus was scourged, and we've seen Christian art throughout the centuries depicting the scourging of Jesus. And they always show his back shredded. Mel Gibson in his film had, had his back shredded. But if you're standing behind someone and you're scourging them with a, a three-thonged leather whip, if you take just a baby step closer to that person, you're going to get some of those, those thongs wrapping around and hitting the front of the body. And if you look closely, you can see at on the chest and on the legs and the ankles, all the way down to the feet, there are scourge wounds on the front of his body in addition to those on the back of his body. And this is something no Christian artist over the centuries has ever depicted. So it's my belief that this is one thing that points towards the authenticity of this image. It's more forensically accurate than any depiction ever done of the man of the shroud uh, or of Jesus on uh, and the tortures that were applied to him. Now, looking at the dorsal view, um, the back of the man, you can again see blood stains on the head that cover the scalp from the top down to the bottom. You can see clearly the scourge wounds on the back all the way down to his feet. So again, they literally beat him from head to toe, literally. Here you can see a blood stain that's a blood flow, probably from the spear wound in the front of the body that pooled at the small of the back here. Here we can see some L-shaped burn holes that we don't know where they came from. They predate the 1532 fire. We know that because a copy made of the shroud in 1516 showed those L-shaped burn holes uh, not without, uh, but without all the other burns that didn't happen until 16 years later. So, so we know those L-shaped burn holes were pre-existing before the big fire that caused all the serious big damage to the shroud. We don't know what event occurred, but based on the randomness of those patterns and the way they're kind of burnt into the cloth, uh, one of the theories that many of us have is that the, the shroud was folded in quarters at one point because we have we can tell by the four sets of L-shaped burn holes, top layer, second layer, third layer, fourth layer. 
so we can tell that the shroud was folded in quarters and that would allow it to sit nicely on an altar and at the altar what might burn some holes into a piece of cloth would be the the incense sensor and the coals uh, we uh, think perhaps some coals or incense fell out of the sensor and onto the cloth thus burning its way down through four layers of cloth and leaving those l-shaped burn holes we have scourge marks as you can see all the way down to the to the bottom of his feet to his ankles and here you can clearly see a footprint and that tells us something about the position of the man if you lay on your back and you want your foot flat you have to bend your knee so we know that 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 leg of the man of the shroud the knee is bent so that he can get his foot flat onto the cloth. On the other foot, we only see the back of the heel at, with a blood stain from the uh, nail wounds, the uh, crucifixion wounds. So what, what we have here is evidence that's so far beyond any artistic interpretation that just the accuracy and the forensic accuracy particularly was the first clue that this was not some form of artwork. But of course, our team had to go there with the intent of examining all the various theories that had been proposed. It's a painting, it's a scorch, it's a, a, a rubbing, or it was made photographically. And those were all theories that had been proposed mainly by skeptics. Um, and so we had to take those seriously and bring with us the scientific experiments to test for any of those potential methods of creating the image. Uh, I can tell you in advance, we eliminated all those methods by our science. And I'll go into more detail on that as we proceed. Now, continuing on here, you see clearly um, a close-up of the back of the man of the shroud. And you can see those scourge wounds on the body. And here you can clearly see this is what a proposed Roman flagrum would have looked like to create the wounds that we see on the shroud. We've not found a Roman flagrum of this nature, uh, although there have been some um, of these lead weights found, but we're not sure if they came from a flagrum or from something else. So this is what art, an artist's inception of what the flagrum might have looked like. Now, this is the VP8 image analyzer. Back in 1976, several team members, eventual team members, John Jackson, Eric Jumper, and several others, went over to Sandia Laboratories, which is a sister lab to Los Alamos National Labs, because the gentleman there, Bill Mottern, was an X-radiography expert, and he had uh, obtained this device to help him see if he could get more information out of the x-rays that he was making, which of course were classified. Los Alamos Sandia labs are both weapons labs. So much of everything they do there is highly classified. Um, this VP8 image analyzer, I usually tell people kind of looks like an old stereo tuner, but unless I'm speaking to a very old audience, most younger people don't even know what a stereo tuner is. At any rate, what the VP8 does is it takes an image input by a black and white video camera and displays it on a green screen monitor. And what you're seeing on the right here are two video clips taken right from the screen of an actual VP8 with one of my shroud photographs input. And what you can see is that unlike a normal photograph, which yields a jumbled mass and distorted mass of shapes, but nothing coherent, the image on the shroud yields the natural relief of a human form. And you can see it even better down here on the bottom image, but you can notice the swollen cheekbones. You can see the hands, the fingers. I mean, this is not what you get with a normal photo. Now, when I say that, I've always got somebody in the audience that says, well, show us a normal photograph. Okay. So while I was doing this on a real VP8 1997, I went, I was at a friend's house who owned a VP8 at the time. And uh, when we finished with the shroud image, I went and took a photo of his grandchildren off the wall and we put it into the VP8. And let's look and see what a normal photograph does. Well, if you look at the bottom image, for example, look, his hair is going down into his head. His mouth is grossly distorted. The nose and cheeks are flat. 
the kid on the right, his whole face is just flat and his nose appears to be going into his body instead of coming projecting out. What we're getting is a grossly distorted image, but nothing like the natural relief of a human form. And this is the best example I can give you of why this instrument became the catalyst for the Shroud of Turin Research Project to be formed. When Jackson and Jumper and the other gentlemen who were there saw this, they immediately realized that this is a unique image. And they said, you know, we should put a team together and see if we can get permission to go and examine the shroud and determine how that image was formed. Is it a scorch? Is it a painting? Is it a photograph? Is it a rubbing? And so the tests that were designed to examine the shroud tested all those different theories. And we'll talk more about that as I proceed. Now, if in fact, this data is actually in the shroud, we should be able to see it using other methods besides a VP8 image analyzer, which by the way, by today's standards is completely obsolete. Today, modern computers and even smartphones can do just what the VP8 did and, be, and even with better resolution. The eight in VP8 stands for eight bits, which means there was a very limited scale of from black to white and grayscale in between, very limited, so the image is rather coarse. This one that I'm showing you now is the edge enhancement or photo relief technique that we did. It's a darkroom technique that we photographers use, but it reveals the same information. And because photographic film is not restricted to an 8-bit grayscale, we can see far more detail in the image using this technique than the VP8 even showed us. For example, look here and you can see the individual fingers of the hand. You can see all of the scourge wounds covering the body front to back. And you can clearly see the swollen face and cheekbones of the man of the shroud. Now, of course, in the modern computer age, we can do and extract the same information digitally. And that's what this image is for. So. Based on that, a team was formed. And Don Devan, when he called me to ask me what I knew about the shroud, uh, at that point in time said, look, we're gonna put a team together. We're gonna need a photographer. Um, are you interested? And I said, no, <laughs> I didn't wanna get involved in something I felt maybe I shouldn't be involved because um, I didn't know that much about it. But the more I thought about the properties of the image, the more I realized that I cannot encode spatial or topographic information photographically. And so I was curious as to how this image was formed. And it was that image property that ultimately led me to agree to become a member of the team. And I became the official documenting photographer. There was so many photographic experiments that one, photographer could never have accomplished it all if he worked around the clock. So I immediately called Vern Miller, who had been one of my professors years earlier at Brooks Institute of Photography in Santa Barbara, and got Vern involved. And then Ernie Brooks, the owner of Brooks Institute, the son of the founder, um, he brought the resources of the Institute to the project and joined the team. And then Vern Miller brought one of his graduate students, Mark Evans, who was a master of the microscope, uh, brought him on board the team to do the photo microscopy of the shroud, which you'll see a little bit of later. So we worked in, in regional groups. I was in the California group that included all the Brooks Institute guys, um, several optical physicists and imaging experts, Don Devan, um, and two members of our team from the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, including Don Lynn, who you see here, Don Lynn was head of imaging on the Voyager, Viking, Mariner, and Galileo projects for NASA. He was my hero on the team, may he rest in peace. And um, this is why I get so upset when people say we we're a bunch of scientific nutters. We've actually been called that. I mean, NASA and Jet Propulsion Lab and Sandia Labs and Los Alamos National Lab Laboratories, we all have to thank God that they don't hire a bunch of wackos to work there, or they could have blown up the planet by now, uh, because these are all weapons labs. At any rate, 
we worked in regional groups and came together one month before we left for Turin as an entire team for the first time. There was a group in uh, New Mexico, of course, a group in Colorado, a group in California, and a group back east in Connecticut, where some of our medical team members came from, and our administrator and uh, organizer uh, that expedited the shipping and everything else. That's all was on the East Coast. So we came together in Amsterdam, Connecticut for what we called the dry run one month before we were scheduled to go to Turin. And here you can see a special table that we had designed and fabricated that would hold the shroud in place. It was made of steel so we could hold the shroud in place with magnets rather than poking any holes in it or causing it any damage. And that table can rotate either vertically or horizontally as you see it in this image. So we packaged everything up into 80 crates and it was all shipped off to Turin. And we arrived in Turin and here in Turin, you can see this is the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist where the shroud's been kept since 1578. Adjacent to that and adjoining the cathedral, you can go behind the altar of the cathedral and right into the uh, chapel where the reliquary of the shroud was kept in the Guarini Chapel. And then this square building behind that is the Royal Palace. They're all connected, so you can go from one to the next to the next without going outside. And it was in the Royal Palace up on, I think, the second or third floor uh, were the rooms in which we examined the shroud. Unfortunately, when we arrived, the very first bit of news we were given was that all of our equipment had been seized by Italian customs and they refused to release it to us. Uh, we had shipped it in advance and we arrived in Turin a week before the end of the public exhibition. It was on display commemorating its 400th anniversary in Turin. And we, we got there a week in advance so we could unpack everything and get it all ready. And for five days, the equipment was tied up in Italian customs. And the reason for it was we had an X-ray machine with us, a small low power X-ray. And on the crate in which the X-ray was packed was a radiation sticker, which is required. And that apparently put the fear of God into the Italian customs people because because of that radiation sticker, they seized all the equipment and wouldn't release it. And five and a half days passed before it was finally released to us. And it took some real, um, I would have to say, a little politics involved in trying to get everything released so we could proceed. So in the meantime, the Shroud was on public display to commemorate its 400th anniversary in Turin. And so you can look here and you can see people lined up to go in and they only gave you two or three minutes in front of the shroud before they moved you out. And this is how it worked. But look at this. I'm going to back up just for a sec. See this little white building here on the left. Here's a closer view. Yep. That's a hundred thousand people standing in a line waiting to see the shroud for two or three minutes. And it, their wait was as long as 10 hours. The good news is, since then, there was this invention called the Internet. And for successive public exhibitions uh, in 2000, in 2010, and 2015, there was a reservation system put online. You could make a reservation. They would You could pick the date and time you would be there. They told you not to show up too early, show up on time, get in the queue. And the wait was only 15 or 20 minutes during the week, maybe a little longer on the weekends. So this will never happen again. Now, I have some news for you because there was talk that there would be a public exhibition in 2025, which is the next holy year of the Catholic Church. Uh, John Paul II had suggested that as another year to show the shroud publicly. But more recently, uh, one of the textile conservators at in Turin examined the shroud and felt that there was a risk to the shroud because it was being displayed vertically and its own weight was causing potential damage to the cloth. So they now have to find a new way to put it on public display. And consequently, there will not be a public exhibition in 2025, as many of us had hoped. So continuing on, this is inside the cathedral. Cathedral. You can, through this glass wall, you can see the Guarini Chapel where the 
shroud relic reliquary box had been kept for centuries. Here's the shroud on exhibit. And if you look closely down here, you'll see people lined up in front of it at about 10 or 12 feet away from it. And of course, it's behind bulletproof glass. And I think maybe some of you have seen photographs of it uh, through other public exhibitions. But in, uh, in 1978, this is the way it was displayed. This is in the Guarini Chapel. And here behind this grating in this beautiful black marble altar is where the reliquary box with the shroud rolled up in it was stored for centuries. It's not stored that way anymore because in 1997, they had just restored the dome that you see in this photograph and a fire broke out and destroyed the Guarini Chapel, damaged the cathedral and the adjacent royal palace, a lot of smoke and water damage. The shroud was rescued and was take had been taken out of the uh, uh, room here because they were doing the restoration work up on the chapel ceiling. And so the shroud had been moved out into the cathedral itself behind bulletproof glass still. And so they were able to rescue the shroud during this 97 fire, but the Guarini chapel was totally destroyed. And I have to tell you, it's what, 20 some years later now, and they have completely refurbished the Guarini chapel, except for the black marble altar in which the reliquary box had been stored. There's talk that the only way they can rebuild that altar is to reopen the quarry where the black marble came from in Italy and quarry new marble and then have their craftsmen match and duplicate the original beautiful black marble altar that was totally destroyed by the fire. With that in mind, here's, here's the old box that they used to keep it in. The good news is after the 97 fire, they decided that a wooden box might not be the best place to keep the Shroud of Turin. And so they built a new box for it. This is the reliquary box that the Shroud had been kept in. It's now on display in the Shroud Museum, just a few blocks from the cathedral where the Shroud is kept. And so this is what you would see in the uh, museum today. And if you went to the cathedral today, you'll see this large cabinet covered up in one of the uh, niches at the front of the cathedral. And they can roll that cabinet out. The shroud is now kept flat in a nitrogen argon atmosphere, humidity and temperature controlled by computers, light tight, fireproof. And so the shroud is better preserved today than it's ever been in its entire history. And so uh, the fear that it might be degrading, that the image might be either becoming more faint or worse yet, the background darkening until the image disappears. All of that has been stabilized. So the shroud is well preserved today and should be around for centuries to come, all things being equal. But this is what you would see today. Now, once we got to Turin and found out that we couldn't do what we were supposed to do in those first five days, one of the things I was able to do, many of us were able to do, was go to the Shroud Museum near the cathedral. And here I'm being photographed next to Secundo Pia's camera that made the first photograph. That's his actual camera. Hanging around my neck is a Nikon F3, a very high-end camera in 1978. Today, both are equally obsolete because they both use film. Now, today, I have to tell you that it gets more and more difficult to explain to a, a younger audience that the image on the shroud is like a photographic negative because we don't have photographic negatives anymore. In fact, I had a 10 year old kid and I was in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia speaking to a young group. And I had a 10 year old put up his hands and Mr. Schwartz, excuse me, you keep talking about film. Is that a USB device? So a 10 year old kid, this was some years ago, didn't know what film is. And as time goes on, Unless you're talking to somebody over maybe 35, 40 years of age, they don't know about film. Uh, so things have changed in that in the photographic arena as well. At any rate, they did allow us into the Royal Palace. And this is in the room in which we examine the shroud. And I'm looking down this long hallway, which we used primarily as a huge closet to store our equipment cases and camera cases and stuff like that but this is taken from the room in which we examine the shroud looking down that hallway 
And of course, I had this opportunity being from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, not too many royal palaces there. So it was my opportunity, since we couldn't do much else, for me to make some photographs within the royal palace. And one of the things that struck me were these amazing frescoes in the ceilings. And uh, this is the fresco in the room we call the equipment maintenance room, which had actually been a bedroom for visiting royalty when the palace was still being used as a palace. By 78, when we were there, it was already a museum, but it had been used as a royal palace for about 400 years prior to that. So this was one of the frescoes in the ceiling. And, you know, I took these basically for my own personal edification, not realizing that that fire in 1997 and the efforts to put out the fire would cause smoke and water damage to these frescoes. And in 1998, a year after the fire, I was in Turin, was able to present to the Archbishop of Turin large prints of these frescoes. This is the fresco in the room in which we examine the shroud. When we looked up, this is what we saw. And so those photographs I was able to give to the archbishop were hopefully useful in restoring these frescoes to their original beauty and splendor. But that's that's how God works. You know, you think you're doing something that's unimportant. And years later, these images became very important. So eventually, after five and a half days, they allowed our equipment to be released um, and they loaded everything onto a dump truck. And here you can see it. This is in the courtyard of the Royal Palace. Remember that square building I showed you? They've driven this in and we went running up because I was I was nervous that the driver was going to pull the lever and just use the dump truck and just dump all the equipment out. And he said, oh, of course not but you guys have to unload the truck and do it immediately. So here we are having to unload all our equipment. Now we're down to a day and a half before the shrouds to be brought to us. It was going to be brought to us after the, at the end of the public display, it had been on display for, uh, for a number of weeks. And once that display ended, they would then bring the shroud to us from the cathedral through the, uh, Guarini Chapel and into the Royal Palace where we would do the examination. But in the interim, we had to load all of this equipment in all these large crates, bring them up two or three flights of marble stairs. It was definitely a very stressful moment for all of us. And because we had lost five and a half days, nobody went to sleep that night. We worked through the night to get everything in and unpacked. And here you can see ultimately the table that we brought with us, you can see that it's made of steel. And if you look real closely, you can see that there are removable panels in the table. And the reason for that is we were going to do x-rays and you can't do x-rays through steel. So the table had to be designed so the panels could be removed in a section, the width of the x-rays, so that the x-ray guys could make x radiographic images of the shroud. And so the problem we got was once we got to Turin, this is a steel table, but I didn't say stainless steel. Stainless steel is treated with chemicals, and they were fearful that those chemicals could be harmful to the shroud. So it's just plain steel. Problem with plain steel is it oxidizes. And when we unpacked it and put it all together, it was like a white powdery surface dust on each of those panels. But fortunately, we had brought with us two gentlemen from the Jet Propulsion Lab, NASA, and they were smart enough to anticipate this could be a problem and brought with them several rolls of gold foil mylar, the same stuff you've seen in the cargo bay of the space shuttle and on satellites, literally gold impregnated mylar. They brought that with us and we had to cover each of these panels with the gold foil mylar. But think about this. These guys anticipated that could be a problem and were prepared to deal with it in Turin. You know, when you're in Turin, you can't run home and get something you forgot. It's a long drive across the Atlantic Ocean. So I'm just amazed at the thoroughness and the thoughtfulness of the scientists who are involved in this project to anticipate all the potential problems and be prepared to deal with them on a professional level. I used to laugh at this photo and tell, look at that modern technology in front of that 400 year old tapestry, except that I have no idea what that box does, that electronic box, but I imagine you have an app for it in your phone by now. At any rate, this is Rudy Dichtel and his wife, Joan, 
uh, preparing. Rudy was there to maintain the equipment for us. He was an expert at doing that. Here, Vern Miller in the foreground, Ernie Brooks behind him, unpacking some of the photographic equipment. And you can see the ornate palace in the background. This is not the laboratory setting that one might imagine that a scientific examination would come under. This is what we call the equipment maintenance room. And I showed you the fresco. You can see it above there. I showed you that fresco a moment or two ago. Notice the parquet wooden floors, which, by the way, moved. They're 400 years old. When you walk on them, they, you could feel them moving a little bit and giving. And I want you to notice that's a garden hose, a couple of garden hoses running through the room, through this back door here into the room where we examine the shroud. And that's because this was before solid state electronics. And some of the instruments we had had to be water cooled. Well, I'm standing in the doorway of the equipment maintenance room here. To my left is a hallway. And at the end of that hallway is the only functioning bathroom in the Royal Palace. So we had to run out and buy a whole bunch of garden hoses, string them all together, hook them up to the faucet in the bathroom, run them down the hallway through the equipment maintenance room and into the room where we examine the shroud. And you can see them coming in here. You can see the table being set up here uh, for the shroud examination. We also had to cover with foil the windows because although they had shutters, they were cracks and sunlight would stream through. And we were doing some thermal imaging with thermal cameras and the sunlight would do harm and would drive the uh, instruments crazy. So we had to put foil over the windows to minimize any uh, ambient light coming through those windows. Here uh, we have Don Devan. This is the man that brought me onto the team. This is Sam Pellicori, optical physicist, and Vern Miller, who became the lead scientific photographer on the team. And they're setting up the camera support system. Remember that the shroud is 14 and a half feet long. And if you photograph it, you can't photograph the whole thing. You couldn't get far enough away from it to see the room is not that deep. So we had to photograph it in sections. And if you're doing that, you want to be able afterwards to put those different photographs together to create a single image of the shroud. And so what they're doing is setting up the camera support system with a rail. They're measuring the distance and they sandbagged it in place. And then we could slide the camera along that rail and the distance would meet, remain precisely the same. And so 20 years later, when I took my four inch by five inch film, I photographed the shroud in two halves. And I put them in Photoshop to put the two together because of what they're doing in this photograph. When I went to put the two together, it was a perfect match. So these guys anticipated things that you might not even think of in advance, but they thought of it. Well, if any of you have been to Italy, you know that things kind of run on what they call Rome time, which is a little bit behind schedule on normal things. So imagine our shock when an hour and a half ahead of schedule, somebody yelled, here comes the shroud. And so I went running out in the hallway, had to put the lens on the camera, turn on the flash. I made one photograph. You can see this is the back door of the Guarini Chapel. They've just brought the shroud through the cathedral, from the cathedral through the Guarini Chapel into the Royal Palace and down the hallway and into the room with the shroud uh, where we would examine it. Now, in this photograph, you can see already the shroud is in the room with us. And you can see the gold foil mylar on the panels. But if you look real close at the end, you'll see we hadn't even finished putting the mylar onto the panels and already the shroud is being unveiled before us. So that was a pretty amazing moment. Eventually, of course, we did get the panels covered. And this is the first look at the back, uh, at the shroud itself. Now, if you look closely, you'll see that on the left are the Italian scientists, on the right are the Americans. And they had told us, you can examine the shroud, but if you touch it, the carabinieri, the state policemen, plainclothesmen that were all guarding the shroud with their with guns, uh, if we touched the shroud, they would shoot us. So we thought they were being serious. Of course, they weren't. But notice that the guys on the right, the Americans, notice where their hands are behind their back. <laughs> you, you can't examine the shroud of Turin with your hands tied behind your back. I'm not sure if they thought that was a humorous thing to do or if they were just being mean spirited, but obviously nobody shot anybody. And you can see the Italian gentleman, Professor Gio here. Uh, he was already reaching out and started to handle the shroud and there was no gunfire. 
Continuing on, again, you can see that we still haven't covered those last few panels. And now you can see how the shroud was publicly displayed in 78. It was thumbtacked to a piece of wood. And that means every place there was a thumbtack, they had to pull out the thumbtack, there was a little circle and hole, and the circle was a little circle of rust. Then eventually those had to be cleaned. We decided to make a steel table and use bar magnets covered in Teflon so we'd leave no traces of metallic particles on the cloth. But they publicly displayed it thumbtacked to a piece of wood. And here they're removing those thumbtacks. And so finally, we got the table, all the panels covered, table is rotated horizontally, and then the shroud was, once the thumbtacks were all removed, the shroud was then moved onto our table and fastened by these bar magnets that you can see surrounding the shroud. And that's how we were able to examine it. First up, I'm sorry, I'm gonna back up just for a second here. And here you can see as the table is being rotated into a vertical position. But you can see that what we did was we smoothed it out and we had to be careful. The shroud is a woven fabric. If you pull on it, it stretches. So we had to be careful not to pull on it, but to smooth it out. Otherwise, we could have easily distorted the image on the cloth. So we had to be very careful in how we put it onto this table to be sure that we didn't cause any distortions to the image. Up first was Max Fry. Max Fry was a Swiss criminalist. Switzerland's just a, a 20 minute drive from Turin. In fact, in Turin, you can see the actual Matterhorn uh, in Switzerland in the Swiss Alps. So uh, Turin's right up in north, northern part of Italy. And Max Fry was a Swiss criminalist who had pioneered the use of sticky tape on the clothing of crime scene victims. <laughs> He was not a member of our team. The Italian group had to go first, obviously. The only problem was Max Fry apparently stopped on his way to the palace that day and picked up the cheapest roll of dime store sticky tape he could find. And the problem with that is every place he stuck his sticky tape, he left some gummy residue on the surface of the shroud. Well, it's a sticky substance. And over time, dust gets trapped on that. And so eventually they had to clean all the places where Max took his tape samples from. Our team also had tape samples. But Ray Rogers, the lead chemist of our team from Los Alamos National Labs, contacted the 3M company. And 3M produced a very special tape for us that would leave no gummy residue on the shroud and that the optical properties of the mylar backing of the tape were such that we could do polarized light microscopy right on the tapes. So there's a little difference between the preparation of the STERP team and the preparation of Max Fry, which was obviously somewhat last minute. And the worst part of it was the pressure that we watched him putting on the shroud. And a little later, I'll show you how we applied the tape and how much pressure we applied was controlled rather than just sticking our thumb down. Max was about to put his tape on the face of the man of the shroud when John Jackson, the co-founder of our team on the right, grabbed him and physically pulled him away from the shroud. And if it looks like the two of them are about to hit each other and the man in the middle, Professor Luigi Ganella, the scientific advisor to the Archbishop of Turin, if it looks like he's acting as a referee, that's exactly what's going on here. There was a very heated debate for about 10 minutes, and it was then decided no one would put any tape on the face of the man of the shroud, because that's the most iconic part of the shroud's image, and nobody wanted to do any harm to that face. But Max almost did. Now, once Max finished with his tape sampling, Professor Rigi, Italian researcher from Turin, was given the next opportunity. Rigi was given two weeks notice, and that was it. And he had no budget, no time to prepare, but he came up with several good ideas for experiments. He was a very knowledgeable scientist. And he got the idea of separating the shroud from the backing sheet that the poor Clares had sewn on it in 1534 in, in certain areas and inserting between the two sheets a endoscopic camera 
and a vacuum to vacuum any dust and debris that might have been trapped between the two cloths. So here you can see the sister is separating the shroud from its backing sheet. And at that moment in time, I realized nobody had seen the backside of the shroud in 450 years since the sisters had sewn the backing sheet on it in 1534. So I ran around the other side of the table and made the first photograph of the first look at the underside of the Shroud of Turin in 450 years. And that's a precise moment of, that this occurred. And this photograph's been published many, many times. I guess it's got something to do with the sincerity and the seriousness on the faces of these men and what they were doing, um, taking this project very seriously. I, I don't know what the sister was thinking, but I felt for her. And so I made this photograph of her um, because her role was to be taking care of the shroud. And all of a sudden there's a bunch of American guys from big name laboratories poking and prodding it. And I imagine this was rather stressful for her. So I, I made this photograph and I, I share it with people in her memory. These are her hands actually. And you can see she's lifted one fiber from the cloth and you can see how small the sample was. And this wasn't for the STIRP team. This was for the Italian group. We didn't cut any pieces of the shroud. We only lifted tape samples of the surface of the shroud, but no, no pieces were cut as this one was. So Rigi inserts his endoscopic camera system and his um, vacuum between the two sheets and collects a bunch of material. The problem with the vacuuming of in between is there's no provenance. You don't know if the particulates came from the shroud, from the backing sheet, or just got trapped in between from some other reason. So it's very hard to do science from the, the dust that was vacuumed by Rigi. Although some people have done some work from it, it's very hard to give it much credence because there's no provenance for any particles you find. Now here you can see the vacuum that he used. And up in the handle here is a place for a sterile filter. And that's where he collected his data from the shroud in these sterile filters. He then inserted his endoscopic camera. Now, an endoscopic camera, if you don't know, is a camera with a long fiber optic bundle, camera and light and lens at one end and the camera body itself at the other end. So you can stick it between the two claws and examine the underside of the shroud. This was a clever idea. And Rigi knew that his camera, uh, endoscopic imaging system, could see an image 10 centimeters in diameter. So how do you know what you're looking at from underneath? He went and got and, and had fabricated a 10 centimeter grid made of string that he could lay on the shroud. And then he could turn on his focusing lamp and he would know precisely what above he was looking at from below. Now, as soon as he did this, something else happened. That's the forehead blood stain, the epsilon or three number three blood stain. And you can immediately see that the blood soaked into the cloth and added density when light was transmitted through the cloth. Well, once we saw that, we realized to think about this, if this were a painted sheet and somebody had applied paint to this cloth, then with transmitted light, we, we would see that right away. So they asked me and they added to my list of tasks to photograph the entire shroud with transmitted light. And so a day or so later, I was able to do so. And here's that image. And this is the first evidence, scientific evidence that I can show you that this is the beginning of the proof that nothing was applied to the shroud to create the image because let's look at it for a minute. Look, there's the number, there's the spear wound blood stain. There's the blood stain on the arms, at the back of the wrist. There's a water stain. There's scorches and patches and holes and more water stains. What don't we see? We don't see any image because the image is only a few microns thick on the top surface of the fibrils, did not penetrate in the way paint or any added pigments would have. This is the evidence. Now, here's an example. There's the shroud. 
and superimposing one over the other, you can clearly see no image visible with transmitted light. And this is the first evidence I can show you that nothing was added to this cloth to create this image. Now, rather than rattling off a whole bunch of highly technical terminologies, instead I thought I'd put the words up on the screen. Notice I haven't put a lot of words on the screen here. Don't need to make notes, there is not a quiz at the end. Um, but these are some of the instruments, and this tells you what these instruments were responsible for. And in its day, this was the best spectral instrument in the world. And I, the reason we know that is Roger and Marty Gilbert of the Oriel Corporation that designed, developed, and sold these around the world to laboratories were both members of our team. And that's Marty Gilbert in the photograph there. And this was state of the art in 1978. But I want to point out to you, today we'd have a laptop hooked to this. You wouldn't need the chart recorder in the foreground, which is the way they extracted data in those days. So even though this was state of the art circa 1978, by today's standards, this is all museum quality equipment now. And the technology has rapidly advanced with solid state electronics instruments are smaller, lighter, uh, not impacted as much by temperature the way the older instruments were. So we've come a long ways in the 45 years since we examined the cloth. Now, remember I told you about the, uh, the low power x-ray that cost us five days in customs. There it is. Now, you know, when you go to your dentist and he take, puts a little film in your cheek and he takes about one second to expose that film, the exposure time with this low power x-ray, because x-rays could be harmful to the shroud, this is a very low power x-ray. Each exposure was 20 minutes. Well, remember those parquet wooden floors I talked about? We all had to leave the room when he was making his exposures. The other thing was this, back in those days, traffic was routed literally right next to the palace. So every time a truck or a big bus, something went by, the whole building would vibrate. And so they couldn't make x-rays during the day when all the traffic was happening. They had to wait until the middle of the night when the traffic had died down. And we all had to leave the room. And once Bill Modern, the guy on the right there, began an exposure, he couldn't move his feet for 20 minutes because he was standing on those parquet wooden floors. And so making 43 x-rays, which they accomplished over a number of the nights that we were there, uh, they were still able to make 43 x-rays that came out perfectly well because we took those precautions of leaving the room and only allowing the x-rays to be taken in the middle of the night where there'd be no vibrations that would blur the x-rays. Now that x-ray machine was very important to us, but it presented a new problem. So, you know, when you come through an airport, what do we all have to go through? X-ray machines. Well, if we exposed the x-rays to the shroud and then brought them back to process them here in the United States, there was high risk involved in bringing them through an airport, which could have potentially damaged or fogged or even ruined completely the x-rays. So the only alternative was to bring with us an x-ray processing unit and process the x-rays on site. And that's what we had to do. Now, what do you need to process x-rays? You need Two primary things. One, you need a room that can be made totally dark. Two, you need a water supply. Consequently, we had to make do with what we had, and we had to convert the bathroom into an x-ray processing dark room uh, every night or so, so that they could actually process these x-rays and examine and evaluate them while we were still there so that in case there was a problem, they could go back and redo if necessary. Fortunately, that wasn't the case. But this shows you that we kind of had to play it by ear in some parts of this project. Uh, this wasn't the laboratory setting we would have liked, but this is what we were given and this is what we had to adapt to and we did. But I, I show this photograph because it indicates how we had to make do with what we had. We also did photomicroscopy. It's photographs through a microscope. Um, this happens to be one of the blood stains on the shroud. That was Mark Evans. 
And here you can see one of the blood stains on the shroud. Notice the blood is still reddish in color. We still don't have an answer to why that's the case because typically old blood turns brown or black even, uh, and sometimes within 20 or 30 minutes. And this is, you know, two centuries, uh, 2000 years old, two millennia old. So we, we don't know exactly yet why the blood remained red. There are theories about it, but none have been proven conclusively to a scientific certainty. Uh, we also did ultraviolet fluorescence photography. That's Vern Miller and Don Devan, uh, back to you. Uh, UV fluorescence photography can reveal things that natural light and the human eye cannot see without uh, using this technique. So it could reveal things that aren't visible normally if you just stand in front of the shroud. And this is one of the ultraviolet photographs Vern Miller made. I want you to notice, you can clearly see, by the way, the shape, the oval shape of the blood of the spear wound and the blood flow from it. But if you look closer, you might notice around the periphery, a lighter area. And that is a halo of serum. The serum is the liquid portion of blood. Through capillarity, that will spread out into a cloth, as you've seen. Uh, with any any time you spill liquid onto a piece of cloth, you can see it spread out via capillarity. But the the solid parts of the blood, the blood red blood cells and white blood cells, they only go so far, and the clear liquid continued and formed this serum halo around these blood stains. And we found this on many, not all, but many of the blood stains, including some of the scourge wounds. And this is only visible with UV fluorescence photography. So you're not going to tell me that some medieval person thought to include this. I mean, this is evidence that real blood was on the shroud and that it came in contact with a, a human body. And that's what the forensic pathologists say. That's not my opinion. Anyway, here, here I am making my photographs. Yeah, I don't look like that anymore. It's now a race between gray and gone, and looks like gone starting to win. But here I am making my large photographs of the shroud. You can see I'm using a four by five camera with four inch by five inch film. I was also responsible for photo documentation to document where the other researchers took their data from. And I had to create a series of maps for each of the experiments. So here you can see that it occurred to me since we were using magnets, that we got small magnets and gave them to the researchers. So when they took data from a specific area, they would put a magnet in that spot. And when they finished that area, I would come in and make this photograph close up. And then when we finished and came back from Turin, I spent two months producing a series of maps using these images overlaying onto a larger photo. I mean, it was a real chore. Today, I could do it in one or two days in Photoshop. But in those days, I had to do it in the dark room, the old fashioned way, the analog way. But ultimately, I created eight maps, which you can find on shroud.com. And I'm not going to go into detail about them, but they indicate with, with their different maps for different experiments to indicate where each researcher took his data from. Very important stuff. Now, I told you that we did have sticky tape samples. Uh, you Here you can see Ray Rogers on the left and Bob Dinegar, physicist from Los Alamos on the right, using a torque applicator that Rogers designed and had fabricated. If you look closely, it's a little hard to tell. This is a pointer and there's a scale here. And when they applied pressure to the roller to apply the tape to the shroud, they could control the amount of pressure that was applied. Unlike Max Fry and his thumb, and this made it a lot easier and more scientific to know exactly how much pressure was applied in putting these tapes on the cloth. Once the tapes were removed, Rogers realized if you stuck them down onto glass, anything embedded in the sticky side of the tape was just going to get further pushed deeper into the gum of the tape. So he had designed and had fabricated these well slides. If you look closely, you'll see that the tapes are only touching at the edges, and there's a few millimeters of space between the sticky side and the glass below it. Again, all of this thought of in advance, fabricated in advance, shipped over to Turin. Uh, that's the thoroughness of planning that this team went through. We also had a computer. 
um, never worked. It only did this. We're not sure what that is, but that's all he could ever get it to do. Bob Ewing, the guy back there. And ironically, this was 1978. You couldn't just go into your nearby store and buy yourself a computer. In those days, if you wanted a computer, you bought a kit and you built the computer. And that's exactly what this is. And if you'll notice, it says IMSI 8080. That's the chip in this computer. To give you an example of another use of that same chip, you know, those little clocks that you can buy with a magnet on the back, you put it on the fridge. When the battery dies, you just toss it and get another one. That's the chip that's in this computer. I have no idea what all the switches, the red and blue switches are for. And the box it's sitting on underneath is an eight inch floppy disk drive, 186 kilobytes per floppy disk. And so it, he, he was never able to get it to do anything. I'm not sure what he would have used it for because there was no real software in those days to be used. You had to create your own, write your own code in those days. So we really didn't have the benefit of using computers in our 1978 examination. Now, the materials that we brought back ultimately could be then computer enhanced or computer uh, digitized and many of much of it was but at the time we didn't have the benefit of a nice laptop like i'm talking to you from right now to uh, create our end result so we came back and we spent the next three years examining our data reducing it writing it into papers and submitting those papers to the finest peer-reviewed scientific journals that were available. And our work was then published in these. So remembering that our, our primary goal in Turin was to go and determine how the image was formed. We weren't there to prove it was Jesus. We weren't there to prove the resurrection. These are not things that science can do. We were there simply to determine how is this image formed? And in the end, we really couldn't answer that question. We could tell you what it's not. We've proven it's not a painting. It's not a scorch. It's not a photographically made image. And I'm not going to go into details on why, but our science proved those things. Um, or, or rubbing with red iron oxide, as some people have said. But we don't know of a mechanism that can create an image with the same physical and chemical properties that have been documented on the Shroud of Turin. So the only correct answer after all of that work was, we don't know how that image was formed. There are still some theories that haven't been fully explored, but the real answer is we just don't know at this point. So many people believe that this is a product of the resurrection, that's possible. But that's not someplace science can go. Science cannot address that because the scientific method says you can't use an unknown, the mechanism of resurrection, to prove another unknown, the mechanism of image formation on the shroud. So in the end, it still remains a mystery. And, you know, people have uh, asked me about my involvement and whether or not it's impacted my faith. I was raised in Orthodox Jewish home. I believe that one does not need to be a Christian to accept the historicity of Jesus of Nazareth and to accept the peer reviewed science pointing to this object being something that came in contact with that man's body. And you don't need to be a Christian to accept those facts. Um, the resurrection, on the other hand, that's a whole separate issue. And I leave that to the theologians and philosophers in the group. So with that in mind, that brings me to the end of this part of the presentation. So I'm going to bail out of this, and stop the share, and come back and put my face on the screen. So at this stage of the game, uh, I'm open to allow people to ask questions um, if somebody has questions to ask.
Well, I'll be glad to uh, answer any, don't go away, he might be back. Any questions that you guys might have, uh, y'all tell me if he's back. Any questions maybe I could address? Yes, uh, with, with the um, the technology they had then, will they ever be able to go back and re reevaluate the turret? It's a really good question. Um, can they go back and reevaluate? All they can do is take the data that they collected and use that to reevaluate it. Some of the sample things they did a lot of different photographs, chemical analysis. Uh, analysis of particulate matter, dirt, and stuff that was embedded in the knee and the nose of the picture on the shroud, of the shroud. And the um, fascinating thing about that is that the particulate matter that they picked off the shroud corresponds exactly to the limestone that has been found around the streets of Jerusalem today. Uh, in fact, the one of them is they, they do this through something called mass spectrometry, and it's extremely accurate, and they have pinpointed it down to dirt by the Damascus Gate, which is the closest gate to the point of crucifixion. So there are so many things. Um, they found flower petals on the scalp uh, and elsewhere that are identified as flowers that just bloom in Jer the Jerusalem area, only place on earth, and only like during March and April, which is the time of the crucifixion, which is Passover or Easter, our time. So there's a lot that's been found. Now, will they ever allow another scientific study? It's been since 1978, and they have not allowed, the authorities have not allowed another study since. So who knows? Thank yeah, thank you. Thank you Thanks sir. for coming. Well, what do you think, Hunter? You think we've lost him? Okay. Yes, Sam. Yeah. I know there have been many advancements in DNA science. They have cycles that they could do that testing. Sam, they, they did DNA testing, um, and what they do know is that it's from a, a male uh, of Middle Eastern descent. Um, the blood type is type AB, which is rare among us, but it's common in the Middle East. Um, those are the hard facts that they know. They do know that it is blood, and they know that from chemical analysis of the blood. Uh, one theory that I've read and heard is that the blood is still red because of bilirubin. Bilirubin is a, kind of a waste product of blood. And during times of extreme physical or even emotional stress, the body will break down red blood cells. It goes to the liver. It's converted to bilirubin. And the presence of bilirubin in blood keeps it red. It doesn't change to the, the brown color or even the black color, the color that we're accustomed to with old blood. So that could explain why it is still red. But the, uh, there's no, they don't know, like he explained, after all these years and all these tests, there's no explanation for what, how it was formed, ex except a very intense, high, sudden, brief burst of radiation. A very intense radiation lasting a very short period of time, but extremely powerful, could make this kind of an image. I have my personal opinion about where that radiation came from. Uh, I think the resurrection is a very powerful thing. And I think uh, inside that tomb there was a burst of light and radiation the world has never seen before nor will see again. And that's where this image came from. Uh, I'm, I started studying the shroud as a skeptic uh, for many, many years. And, and I've been looking at it for about 40 years. <laughs> Back in the early 1980s, I got interested in it. Uh, it was just an interesting relic, and um, I wasn't really a strong believer at that point. Um, but as time has gone by and more and more evidence has come forth, I think it takes, personally I think, it takes more faith to, uh, for those 
folks to believe it's a fraud than it does to believe in it. The scientific evidence is just overwhelming. Well, it is, well, it's 10 till 8. Yes. No. Around the blood? Where did the water uh, around the blood come from? Came from the blood. You know, blood, if you take it and you centrifuge it down, it separates into red cells and then the serum, the liquid portion of the blood. And um, I've, <laughs> I've dealt with a lot of blood in my, my career and uh, I've seen blood-stained sheets, and you can actually see this with blood on fabric the next day. You can see the blood if it hasn't been cleaned. Then surrounding that, a little halo of clear stuff. And that's where just through capillary action, the serum has leaked out of the blood clot, so to speak, and into the fabric. And that's been replicated on the shroud. Again, proof that this really is blood that can have been painted on there by some painist back, you know, in the Middle Ages that knew how to do this. There's just no way. Yes, Sam? What dating Good question. Back in the, what was it? trying to think of when it was, but anyway, some, some radiocarbon dating was done on the shroud, and it made headlines all over the, all over, big headlines, the shroud is a fake. And when I saw that, that's when my interest in the shroud just disappeared. Uh, I thought, man, it, it is a fake, I'm done, I believe in radiocarbon dating, and this radiocarbon dating showed that the, um, the object was from the Middle Ages, around 1330 A.D. So obviously it could not be the burial shroud of Jesus. What they now know with total certainty is the sampling places that they got it from were in error. There were wrong places. They included areas that had been um, adulterated with cotton thread, uh, places of the repair patches that were done, and so it was just terrible sampling data that they used. Uh, since then, Sam, the dating, I don't know um, exactly the name of the dating techniques that they used. Uh, I didn't get into that in great detail, but the dating things now point to 2,000 years old. I can get that information for you. I just don't know right off the top of my head. So uh, that's all been clarified. How did it get from Israel to Turin? Good question. The, um, the shroud, we, they know this by spores. A lot, they can tell where it's been due to spores that have uh, various plants that's been deposited in the shroud. But it started in Israel and then it went to um, Turkey for a while. Um, they don't know exactly how in all these cases. From there it traveled to one town in France and then from there to a town called Leary, France and then back to Turin. And all of this was when it was kind of passed down from one family member to another family. The Savoy family of Italy owned the shroud and for about 500 years and just recently um, change the ownership to the living pope. What that means is that it has to go from this pope to the next pope forever. It can't be sold or gotten rid of any other way. Well, uh, if you wish to leave a, a contribution to his research team, research program, uh, money doesn't go to Barry. I don't think he needs it, uh, but it does go to help help with education and research on the shroud. You know the usual routine here: just drop it off out there, and it'll all it'll all go to his organization. Oh yeah. 
Oh, okay. There's a plate on the table. Okay. Any other questions? And we'll get y'all out of here. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, good night and God bless you.